Good morning. Um, I think it's lovely to see so many people here this morning. Um, I'm Tony Marker. I'm uh, chair of the Opal Department. Um, I've been here for 11 years, and a lot of my focus over the past 11 years has been in um, model refinement and development in the field. Uh, and it was during the first couple of years of my um, time here that I had students starting to say, well, we've got all these models and some of these models don't fit together. And so at one point, uh, the students and I sat down and, and started uh, coming up with what we thought was a little more integration between some of the pieces in that. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. How do you bring some of these pieces together? So um, here are the things that I'm, I'm hoping that we'll cover today. We're going to review the problem, the, uh, the process of problem diagnosis just in general. This is going to be really uh, a review for, for uh, almost all of you at this point. Uh, we're going to talk about dividing the environmental data into levels. And then we're going to talk about comparing uh, Gilbert's BEM to the synchronized analysis model, the SAM. Uh, after that, we'll talk about tracing causes uh, to their common source using the five-way technique. Uh, we'll talk about identifying high leverage solution points using events, patterns, and structures. That, that, that comes from uh, systems analysis. And then finally, we'll talk about when to use the BEM versus when to use the SAM versus when to use some other model. Um, so that's, that's what we've got coming up ahead of us. And my apologies for using a, a really old Boise State PowerPoint template, but uh, when I started to shift it over, nothing fit and all the colors were off. So I, we're stuck with the what we, we around here call the French fry uh, logo for Boise State, which was intended to be a building set against the mountains, but everybody always thought it looked more like French fries. So let's get started. Um, just to review a, 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 a program diagnosis. And, and as you all know, we're interested in human problems. You know what? I'm going to turn off my, uh, my camera. There we go. So it's less distracting. There we go. Maybe less distracting for me. Um, in, in HPT or HPI, we're interested in human performance. We're not necessarily interested in uh, changing the way machines work. Uh, we're interested in those situations where we have humans, we want those humans to perform at a higher level, and we've got some sort of gap. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. So here's the big picture. This is the HPT model uh, that we all tend to be familiar with. This is one, I should say, this is an HPT model, not the HPT model. This is the model that's put forward um, typically by uh, ISPI, International Society for Performance Improvement. The first uh, upper left-hand corner of that is organizational analysis. After that, we have environmental analysis, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these. From those, we get our desired or optimal performance, and we get our current and actual performance. So understanding what's going on in the organization and then what's going on in the environment gives us our two our starting point and our end point. And then in between that, we have our gap. The gap just being that space between where we are and where we want to go. After that, we have cause analysis, where we figure out what's causing the gap. We have inter intervention, selection, design, and development. Implementation. And this is all pulled together by collecting data about what's going on. We call it evaluation. Typically, we in the past, when we've had linear models, we've said evaluation occurs at the end. But really, evaluation is really just collecting data about what's working, what isn't working, and making adjustments as you go. So we're always collecting data and feeding that data back into what we're doing so that we can make it better. So today, what we're, we're talking about is really this section. The organizational analysis, environmental analysis, up through cause analysis. How can, what, what can we do in order to connect that a little bit better? So 
In other words, what we're talking about when we talk about human performance is here we have, you see over here on the left, we have uh, our current, our worker, our performer. And what we're trying to do is take that worker or performer from where they are to optimal performance or desired performance, if you will. Uh, and that's our goal. But what we often find is that between where we are, where those performers are, and where we want to go, we often have numeral, uh, numerous obstacles. And our job in most cases is to remove those obstacles from the path of the performer so they can do a better job. So let's start with organizational analysis. When we think about what we do in organizational analysis, it's really trying to get an understanding of where the organization is going, what's its vision, what's its mission, what things does it value, and how does it want to get there? So why might, let me just sort of throw the door open on this, why might those things be important to you? Daphne says alignment, prepare a business case, excellent. Mickey says alignment as well, alignment. Help us access worth of performance, good. SBO is critical. Wait just another couple seconds for people to finish typing. External drivers, good. Align the end results with the SBOs, yep. Right, so you got the most important things, alignment and important information about context. Unless we understand what the organization values and what those external constraints and boundaries are, it's gonna be very difficult to come up with any sort of intervention uh, that can align with those. And understanding that context also provides us with a target. Uh, it's, off, it's awfully difficult to, to hit a target if you don't know what the target is and what the constraints are around it. So absolutely right, you were, you were, um, you gave me the responses that I was looking for. Now let's move shift down to environmental analysis. This is where we look at the external environment, the organization, work processes, and the worker. Uh, so we're gathering information about what's going on at several levels. And why is this important? Let's, for instance, give me, a, somebody, if you can, give me an, an external environmental variable that might be important when you're thinking about uh, looking at causes and looking at uh, solutions to a performance problem. What's something in the external environment that might be important? Government regulations, great. Regulatory environment, right. Market pressures, laws, excellent. All, all of those are excellent responses. Right, you certainly don't wanna be designing a solution that would uh, violate regulations or laws or policies. Uh, contribution to society, excellent, that's good too. All right, so what's something at the uh, worker level that we might want to take into consideration when we're looking at uh, the variables that might impact uh, causes and solutions? Knowledge, capacity, and motives, very good. Ethical considerations. Current skill levels, good. Technical expertise, strengths, education, job fit. Excellent. Yeah, so you guys get it. Um, you're, what you're trying to do is, is collect the variables that are likely to have an impact on, on where people are right now. Uh, so you need both of these pictures because what you do is you're trying to combine the pictures and come up with, uh, identify that gap. So let's just talk about environmental analysis models. There are several, some of which uh, you may be familiar with, others maybe not so much. Uh, we've got a number of really good ones in the field already. Rummler and Brace, uh, their organizational white space model, uh, I think is a good one. Uh, Roger Kaufman's organizational elements model, Langdon's language of work, Rothwell's model. We'll take a uh, look at how levels appear in some of these models. So for instance, here's Rumler and Braish. Can you see my, you can't see my mouse, I'm guessing, or, or can you? Uh, do you see my mouse on the screen? All right, great, you see the mouse, wonderful, even better. So when you're thinking about levels in Rumler and Braish, you can see here, we have a sort of typical hierarchy here with, a, with um, 
maybe you see you at the top, each of these squares, these, these uh, vertical columns is a functional area. So this might be marketing, this might be production, this might be a logistics and delivering here. So you've got individuals that work in all these functions and you've got processes that run across the functions. So the process of creating a uh, product or a service would probably run across many, if not all functions, depending on the organization. So you have a one level is job performer. Another level is this process level. And you have another level that is the organizational level. So in the Roman Abracius model, you've got three levels that they identify. Let's move on and look at how that looks like, uh, what that looks like in Kaufman's environmental, uh, I mean, uh, organizational elements a model. Um, when Kaufman breaks it up, he looks at individuals or groups which have products. He looks at the organization that has an output, and he looks at society that has the outcome. So he's looking at the micro level, the macro level, and the mega level. So you can see that when we've done environmental analysis in the past, as we've started to develop these models, people have been looking at different levels of environmental data for quite a while. Let's look at another one. This is Langdon's, Langdon's language of work uh, model and his envir uh, environmental levels are individual, processes, work groups, and business units. So what is one of the things so far that you've noticed about the labels for the levels that we've used in different models. Right, right. We're not very consistent. We seem to be describing very similar things, but we're not, we haven't agreed on, on terms, although we keep getting closer and closer, I think. All right, so each of those ends up being levels. This is just, if we looked at all four of those, what we can see are some similarities and patterns. You can see that some, some of the models have three levels, some have four levels. And what we did in class, we started to look at these and say, all right, what are the commonalities between the way that all of these models are looking at how we look at the environment and how we split it up? And can we then boil that down in a way that might be useful to us when we start to connect it to other things? So all of that environmental analysis, when we start to pull that together, gives us the information we need to come up with our, our, our current or actual performance at the time. And when we look at the organizational analysis, it gives us, gives us the information that we need to really fill out our desired or optimal performance. Current performance, optimal, optimal performance. That's what we're trying to do here. And we, we have a gap in between them. That brings us to cause analysis. And cause analysis, as you all at this point, I'm sure know, is about identifying the barriers so we can take get rid of them. Now, we're gonna set aside the fact that sometimes we do a cause analysis as a, as a way of trying to identify an opportunity as opposed to removing uh, current obstacles. Let's just stick to the most common uh, uh, problems that uh, we tend to run into in human performance improvement, and that is where somebody is actively um, there's an active discrepancy between where we are and where we want the, the performer to go. So what's the problem? Well, when we were, were discussing these in class, what we found is that the, currently the information we collect about the environment doesn't fit into the structure of the BEM. That's the model we tend to at least start out with most, most often when we're doing a cause analysis. It doesn't fit into the BEM very easily. So when we're trying to match the environmental data that we, we've collected to the cause analysis model, you can see there's four levels on the environmental analysis, but when we look at Gilbert's BEM, we only have a single level. It's not matching up. So here's uh, Gilbert's BEM with the uh, with some of the the detail added a little here, you can see in the information environment cell, that upper left-hand cell, you've got the data expectations, feedback, standard operating procedures. 
we won't go through a lot of that uh, in, in detail here, but you can see you've got one level of environment and one level that deals with the individual. One level here, one level here. So Gilbert's a model primarily we use for, the one that we use for uh, a starting point for a cause analysis in many cases, uh, divides it into six categories, but only two levels. On the other hand, what do we know about where the causes occur in almost all performance problems? And here you've got a pretty good indication um, of some of the data that we have around that. If you look, that, look, we have 11% on, uh, and this is sort of the top of, that 11% for the information on the person, 8%, 6%. So you've got 25% occur here, which means almost all, the vast majority, I'll just say, of performance problems have primary causes that have to do with the environment. 75% of those causes have to do with the environment. The reason that's an issue is because if most of the problems are occurring there, we didn't, get, at least using Gilbert's model the way it was originally intended, it doesn't break it down very much for us. So we clump them all together in those three cells on the top, top line, without very much dis distinction. So here's where we ended up with the class. Uh, we've got on the left, you can see the performer. We, we look at what they're doing. We divide it into those six cells, and we're trying to get it, uh, we're, we're dividing those obstacles into six cells, and then we're trying to get to optimal performance. What we decided to do in order to fix this was to divide the BEM into four rows instead of two rows. The worker on the bottom is the same as, as it is in Gilbert's. But what we've done is we've taken that top level and split it up. So the, what we've done, the only thing that the SAM is really doing here is saying, uh, let's take the, that external um, row on top of Gilbert's and we're gonna split it into three additional uh, rows. So what does the SAM look like? Um, some of you are familiar with it. But when we start looking at this, this, we have the individual worker here, and we've taken those environmental levels and we split them into external, organizational, and job. The causes remain in the same information, instrument, instrumentation, and motivation. So those all end up being the same. And then what we're looking at are these bottom three rows the worker, the job, and the organization are inside the org inside the organization, and that last row, external, is outside the organization. So that really is how we've broken down the SAM. Let me stop at this point and see if you have any uh, questions or comments or thoughts. So this is the core of the SAM, right here. When you strip it away. You're really just talking about expanding Gilbert's BEM to include those additional two rows. That's correct. So why did, uh, did the students in our needs assessment class think that greater definition was important? Uh, and in order to think about that, we really need to think about symptoms versus root causes. What we know is a symptom is often why we're first brought in to solve a problem. A client comes to you, typically what they're coming to you with is a symptom of a problem. Symptoms are what you see, it's what you feel, but they aren't necessarily the cause of something. Root causes are often those things that are hidden behind the symptoms and that take a little digging to, uh, to figure out. So here's, here are some examples. Let me give you three examples and you can tell me what these statements have in, co in, in common. Uh, the first is, Phil's reports are always filled with errors. He's terrible at editing. I'm going to hire an editor to check his work. So uh, examples of what do these statements have in common? Uh, so the, here's the first statement. I won't read each of these. I'll let you read them. Here's one about Jan. And here's a statement 
about employees arriving late to work. So what do you see here? Ray says ID solutions without root causes. Ross says they both jump past cause analysis and make assumptions. All symptoms, right, right. So let's look at this. Everybody seems to have caught onto this quickly. That's good. So we see symptoms in that, that first sentence. We see a jump to a conclusion about what's causing the pain. And we see a random solution that's a reaction to the pain. And this happens all the time. And we, I suspect that if we were to examine our own interactions in our own homes, that we do this a, a great deal too. But the, uh, And that can certainly be uncomfortable, but it can be um, really inefficient and downright harmful when we sort of take those same behaviors and um, predispositions into the workplace. So symptoms versus causes. If we want to have a lasting, if we want to have some sort of lasting result, we're, we're going to have to address the root cause. So for, for instance, you might have a lot of recurring headaches. Well, you can take an aspirin for the headache, but if the headache is, for instance, caused by a brain tumor, the aspirin isn't going to do anything but mask the root cause. So what we want to do uh, as human performance improvement practitioners is to find those root cause and get, get rid of the root causes as a way of providing additional value to whatever client we happen to be working with. So let's look at an example here. Uh, if we were to look, this is a example that's taken from an something called the Instructional Designers Casebook. Um, in, the, in this particular case, you have an asphalt shingle factory. And what this asphalt shingle factory has seen, the management has seen, is a marked increase in accidents over the past several months. And the client comes to you and thinks the problem is just a need for re refresher safety training. Does it sound familiar? Um, and you collect some data to figure out what's, what's causing an increase in accidents. So here's data that you gather about what, what's going on. And I'm just, I'm giving you, we could go through this as an exercise, but then we'd actually need a, a couple hours to do it. So I'm gonna give you some of the answers on this and, and ask you to sort of follow along. Here's what you discover. From your environmental analysis, you learn these, these things. Workers are choosing not to wear safety gear despite possible fines. Uh, the culture values speed over safety. They have a few random sample, uh, sorry, they have new random sampling for quality control. There are dirty work areas, there's dirty equipment, there's increased production line speed. Managers use overtime instead of hiring more workers to deal with workload. There's increased customer demand for product, inadequate rewards and consequences for safe behavior. Some of the workers are older, and fatigue is, is caused by working overtime. So here, those are just some of the things that as you've gone through this plant, you've discovered. So we've gathered the data. Now we're gonna determine the level. So if we plug this, this data into the BEM, here's what it looks like. The client links, thinks the problem is due to a lack of knowledge, right? He wants to do more safety training but you've discovered causes in these other areas as well. So when we plug the data into the BEM, that's what it looks like. And you can see the vast majority of that ends up being in the environment. So when we take that same data and plug it into the SAM, you'll see that this first row looks the same as it did in the BEM. There's no need for discrimination at that point. But as we start looking at the environmental data, we start to see some separation of where some of that 
that um, those causes live. So we've worked to identify and trace the causes back to their source. And what we're going to do next is start to identify root causes. In other words, a way of prioritizing what we're seeing and looking past the symptoms and for root causes. And to do this, we borrowing a technique that we have taken from Kaizen, uh, so quality control uh, and improvement um, methodology. Uh, and we're going to ask why five times to lead you past the symptoms and then to toward the root of the cause. Uh, cause. So when we start using the five whys with, with the SAM, uh, one of the ways we found that we were able to do this, and we're just going to, again, use this, we, we ended up with looking at really focusing on, on these particular uh, causes. We started looking at workers choosing to, to not wear safety gear because it slows them down and said, well, why are they doing that? Well, workers didn't want to work excessive overtime. All right, so what's the problem? What's causing the excessive overtime? Increased production speed, production line speed. So here I'm, yeah, so Ross, you're asked, how did you narrow down the list to focus on those? This is just one path to demonstrate how the five Ys might work. So we started knowing that the workers were choosing not to wear safety safety gear because it closed them down. All right, so then we ask, all right, well, why has the pr production line uh, speed increased? Because management is using overtime instead of hiring additional workers, so they've had to speed up the line. And then why has management had to, had to do that? Increased customer demand for product. So why would you think that it's important to separate this out and know sort of the path that this has taken? Terrific, really good responses, really good responses. So are there any of these over which you don't have control? When you look at this particular slide, which of these particular causes do you not have control over? Right, customer demand is normally a good thing, but you don't really have control over it. So if you back it up and, and look at the first place where you can address this increased customer demand, where would that be? Right at the organizational level. So where that gives you a starting point, a higher leverage point than looking at workers choosing not to wear safety gear. You, could you address going back to the very beginning and, and address workers choosing not to wear safety gear without thinking about overtime? Sure, you could, but would it necessarily end up being a lasting solution? And what we're looking for are lasting solutions, All right? So we started here initial, when we started digging, we looked at worker, we found that workers were choosing not to wear their safety gear because it slows them down. And we ended up with increased customer demand for product. But how do we decide to, uh, where to solve the problem? So let's look at this just a little bit longer. Uh, we still treat all these causes as, as if they deserve the, pri the same priority. So in order to prioritize them, what we're going, going to do is we're going to try and distinguish between the symptoms of what's going on and the best, best place to intervene. So now we've gone through the, the data gathering process. We've plugged it into our model. We've asked, we've tried to trace down where the initial entry points were and trace them back to what the original causes were. And now we're gonna to try to identify the events and patterns and, and structures that will actually tell us where we're most likely to intervene with some success. So who, who has had the, um, the systems thinking, uh, the, the thinking and systems one credit class? Anybody in here? All right, Ross, great. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm not going to single anybody out, Grayley. <laughs> it's it is a it's a really good class to have. It's only one credit. You you uh, it might be something that you consider ta taking after you graduate if you if you want. But uh, it's really good for understanding 
uh, places that can uh, allow you to have a bigger picture understanding of what's going on and identify places where you can intervene. So we're going to be taking uh, a, a page from that. And let me just talk about what this, this looks like and how we might use it. When you think about any particular problem, you can really break it down. So for instance, events are like a snapshot of a single point in time. So if, for instance, if you've got a house burning down, that's an event. Uh, events are symptoms that call for our attention. And while that might be catastrophic and urgent, uh, you can really only uh, react to them after the fact. Solutions to events really never deal with the root cause of the problem. So we can put out that fire, but that doesn't get us any closer to preventing fires in the future. So events are, or probably you may have seen this before, events are like icebergs. They leave a lot out of the picture. All you can see is what's floating on top. So you can spend a huge amount of time reacting to the events without ever making much progress on the problem. Patterns, on the other hand, are a series of events. They're trends of, with multiple events that you can depict using graphs over time. So you, now you've got multiple patterns, multiple fires over time. Uh, and what you're looking for is a way to detect a pattern um, that puts it into context with others. So as you start to track these patterns, in this case, we're gonna track them on the map. Uh, we might do it geographically, we might do it over time, we might do it with uh, the people involved. Uh, we're start to see, we start to see patterns. And as you do that, you should start to see commonalities between the individual events shifting into patterns and looking at the structures. So for instance, structures are the underlying connections that cause the patterns and events. So for, for instance, maybe all of these, uh, in Boise, we're in a valley, but we're, uh, we're bordered by foothills. And a lot of those foothills are in very dry country. Um, so the structures that we might look at there is the, uh, a lack of proactive policies governing the placement of flammable landscaping near homes in fire prone areas. In other words, we've put trees uh, and, and other flammable materials too close to structures and that may be the reason that we're having, uh, we're seeing as many fires as we're seeing. Uh, that's something that we can start to address. If we can address the structures, we're gonna have a lot more influence on future events than if we just try running around randomly putting out fires. So that's what we're looking for. As we start to do cause analysis, what we're really trying to do is find structures. We're trying to find those underlying conditions that enable the pattern of events, not just the single events themselves. So when we look at events, we look at this, this far left, this is really action mode. When you're reacting, when you're dealing with events, let's say, uh, a safety event in a factory that you work at, you're all you're in reaction mode. When you're looking in in for patterns, you're in adaptation mode, and when you're looking at structures, you're in change mode. So react events are all about in the being in the present. You witness the event, you can't really predict it, and you look at what the fastest way to re react to this event now. In other words, it's all about damage control. In patterns, you're looking to adapt, you're trying to move beyond the present, you're measuring and tracking things, and you're looking at the kinds of trends or patterns that seem to be recurring. And finally, when you get down to structures, you're trying to look into the future and say, given all these patterns, what is supporting those patterns? You start looking and using systems thinking tools, and you look at the structures that are causing the patterns so you can alter the structures. So, We've talked about gathering the data. We've determined the level using one, uh, two, actually two of our models. We've discussed how you use the five whys to sort of trace back through those models to what may be causing the root causes. We've identified the events, patterns, and structures that might live, that might be 
demonstrating themselves or manifesting themselves, and then fi fine, finally solving for the root causes. So the in, in, back to our example, we looked at employees were not using safety gear leading to accidents. The root cause was increased demand. The client's initial solution training would not have addressed the root cause of the problem. There wasn't a training problem with this regard uh, in, in this situation. Uh, in, this, in this case, the, what was happening was the, the workers were having to work at an increased speed, increased fatigue, and in order to maintain the speed of the line, they were cutting corners on safety. So higher impact solution point, Management's using overtime instead of hiring more workers, leaving current employees rushed, overworked, and fatigued. So better places to intervene. Bring us back to this point. The client thought the solution was down in this lower left-hand corner with the worker and information. Again, training. The initial symptomatic causes were here. Over on the right-hand side, we thought, well, they're just choosing not to, to uh, to wear the safety equipment. The root cause was way up here in motivation and the higher impact structural solution was at this point. So you can see how dividing the problem out and into a little bit more detail allows you to get a picture of where you might intervene, where those root causes are versus the initial, uh, initial symptomatic events were. So finally, when to use these models. Um, the BEM is still a great model. I use it all the time. Uh, it's, it's my go-to model when I first start thinking about a problem. Uh, and it's also my go-to model when I'm working with new clients or clients that don't have a lot of um, expertise in our field because it's easy to explain. It communicates. And so one of the major uh, uses for a model is communication. So if you were to take the SAM and to start to use it with a client who was unfamiliar with cause analysis and unfamiliar in, about thinking about causes, you could easily lose them quickly. So starting with the BEM is a great idea if you're starting with clients who are unfamiliar or if you're just at the very beginning of a problem and want to do sort of a back of the napkin type of analysis. If you start to see more environmental variables coming into play, or if you're working with more experienced clients, then you can certainly uh, uh, expand what you have in the BEM easily into the synchronized analysis model. And that's where we ended up as a class. And so while the uh, I was the one who wrote the article, this really uh, was a product of a needs assessment class that said, hey, this isn't all fitting together and how do we use these, these tools? And that's something that you can do as well, by the way. You can take models. So I'm, I think that you have this in your needs assessment class. I believe you're reading it. Um, but that's the issue number um, for you to find, find the article if you don't have it. And now let's open it up to questions. What questions do you have? All right, I'm looking at some of these. Are you, so I'm going to address Kevin's first. Kevin's question is, why was the client demand under motivation? Uh, let me see if I can go back. All right, so we can we can look at that question, Kevin, here. Workers are choosing not to wear safety gear uh, because it slows them down. And so the reason we were putting it in motivation is because uh, the behavioral, uh, the behavior that we wanted to change um, involved the choice. It's, it wasn't uh, based on a knowledge or skill. It wasn't based on capacity. Uh, it was because they were choosing not to wear safety care. At least that was the initial, that was our starting point when we started to uh, look at how, um, what was causing that problem. Does that answer your question? Great. So Ross, you had a comment it's a, uh, that you use the SAM over the BEM because the client wouldn't give you access to individual performers. And the SAM helped you to address the issues in the environment with more precision than the BEM. Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons um, that you can use one model or another. And I uh, honestly, I recommend if you have time and the situation allows using more than one uh, model. And I, 
Um, and that's because all models have their blind spots. Uh, the BEM has its blind spots. Uh, the SAM has actually similar blind spots. Uh, but if you're able to use multiple cause analysis models or analysis models in general, uh, you'll have fewer of those blind spots where you, uh, each models prompt you to ask certain questions, but they leave out other sets of questions. And so the more ways you can come at, the more directions that you can come at using different models, the more complete your data set will be about the problem. Uh, can you tell us uh, about some of the cues to use other models like Rumble and Brish? Um, yeah, I think we did a little bit of that. Uh, so for instance, um, one of, when I, when I think about uh, the Rumler and Brace organizational white space model, um, I tend to think about problems and handoffs and communication. So Rumler and Brace, when I, if I start to think that there's a, a problem in a process and a process again is something that that uh, transcends multiple functions. It, it's a process where, is where something gets handed off from one person to the next person. They do something to change it. They hand it off to the next person. They do something to change it. In each of those handoffs, there's an opportunity for, for, for a miscommunication or a performance problem. If I think that that's what's going on, I might then turn to Rumler and Brace to get a better sense to use that set of filters, to use that, that uh, lens to examine the problem. Um, so as you go along, as you become familiar with some of these tools, you'll start to see some of their strengths. You'll start to see some of the weaknesses. And the uh, part of it is just trying to apply them every now and then, instead of falling back on the BEM all the time or the SAM all the time, trying to pull in another model that will, will allow you to see it from a different perspective. Uh, Tony, this is Bob. Can you hear me? Yes. Could I add something about the Rumler and Brach model? Oh, please do. Um, yeah, this is Bud Benz cutter. I'm Chief 529, um, along with Linda. And uh, I have taught in the past MBA courses using the Rumler and Brach model. Um, uh, and I selected that model, and, and maybe this gets to at least part of the answer to the, uh, to the question that you're asking, uh, because the rumbler Brach model is a great model for alignment. I think it really helps people think about and apply organizational alignment. And it also, at each level, uh, organization, process, and job performer forces people to think about management. So how uh, is the organization being managed? How are processes being managed? And how's the job performer being managed? So uh, it has it has particular strength, and I find it very useful when talking to management level people because it emphasizes the importance of management uh, at multiple levels of the organization. So just that's just another perspective on the Rumbler Bridge model. Terrific, thank you so much. Sure. Hey, and Linda, do you want to say something about uh, the difference uh, between? systems models and process models. I know you and I have talked about that before. At the moment, I'm drawing a blank, so I'm not sure what you're referring to. Uh, well, systems models like uh, the anatomy of performance, where you've got inputs, processes, outputs, feedback loops, versus the these process models like uh, the BEM and the Rumble Embrace and sort of the conceptual. Ah, uh, yes, when you're thinking more about um, trying to understand how things are interacting right. rather than just look at the flow, which right. takes us back to, to systems thinking, another piece of it, um, to actually try to draw the connections. And one of the things I like in your, your article write-up of the model is you have all those arrows showing some of the thinking. You know, it's not as though it's all linear and, and, and nice and neat, you know. Um, and uh, um, one of the things that gets taught in the systems thinking course is about causal loops, where you put out on a piece of paper all the different in interconnecting factors and draw directional arrows showing how, how they connect. And although that's a little different than um, 
the sort of flow where we actually look at inputs and outputs, the, li the linear vision of it. I suppose it's a, a, a more modular version of it. It can certainly be really interesting to look at it that way. Is that what you're thinking of, Tony? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to hop in here and just point out uh, Ray's question. Um, because he's talking about, he's asking about handling copyright issues. And while this isn't about the meaning of the models, it's, it's about communicating with, with clients about them. Um, and I, I guess my impulse, sort of before you answer, Tony, is just to clarify with Ray, what's your concern? Is your concern sort of giving credit for a model when you go to talk to people? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so I'll give my, I'll give my response, and then maybe Bud and Linda, you can give your responses too. Okay. Um, my my response to that is that clients typically don't want to know and don't care where the model comes from. Academics do, and certainly when working with academics, you want to be careful with with uh, citing where you've gotten your material and where models have come from. If a client asks where a model has come from, you certainly want to be able to provide that information. But uh, I typically would not go out of my way to give the lineage of a model or its sources with a, a professional client unless they specifically ask for them. Typically, they won't, uh, in my experience. But Bud and Linda may have had different experiences. So, so I from totally my... agree with you, Tony. I don't think I've ever done, I've ever, or very rarely, told where the model came from because in some ways uh, I don't know in some ways it almost detracted from the work so you know if yes if I'm asked to I've certainly provided but it's not something I would volunteer necessarily yeah so the place I can see where it's useful and maybe this is a difference between working as a consultant versus working internally it sort of making it credible as to why you're proposing something you know, so who says this is valid? You know, so if you're getting skepticism, certainly being able to point to published work and the fact that um, there's there's professional work out there and academic work out there supporting these models can be useful. And, and so I think it can be very helpful in, in that way. Uh, yeah, terrific. terrific. Ray, Ray, I'm curious if that answers your question, if you had a situation where you were concerned about um, uh, needing to give credit. Ah, well, if in doubt, I would, you know, if you're going to stick with one, if you want to put a picture in, just credit it in a report the same way that you would in an, an article or a paper for school. Sure. And if I you've mean, adapted it, you know, you could, there's there's APA language for showing that you've adapted it, and then you then you have your uh, your lineage. Uh, Mickey had a question, it's a, a comment rather, pointing out managers are causing the uh, problem is not job friendly. Uh, yeah, uh, managers might get defensive like any of us might if we said, you know, you're the cause of the problem. Um, what I have found is that if you focus on the system rather than the individual and say, listen, management owns the system. Uh, and if you're in, man you know, if your client is in management saying, that's a really good thing. It's a lot easier to change the system, something over which you have direct control, than it is to change a person. Uh, and it's often far less expensive to change the system than it is to change the person. So when you start to talk about it in those terms and, and take it away from the idea of so-and-so is, is, is the cause of the problem and say, You're, you have the ability to change the problem because it lives in the environment, then um, that often, at least I've found for me, changes some of the conversation. Again, Linda or Bud, any thoughts on that? Sounds right to me. Yeah, I think so much, right, so much of this is language, is how we position things. I think if, if you use, the, if you really think about your role as a consultant and the language you use to present you know, issues or your interpretation of issues, you can almost lead the client to the conclusion themselves. You know, you can make it so obvious to them that you don't have to say to them, well, this is your fault. They'll see it, 
you know, in the data and the way that you've interpreted and presented the data. So, you know, I think it's a consulting skill, it's a communication skill that we all need to develop and perfect. Yeah, really good point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what what occurs to me while you're speaking, but is the difference between asking a question like, "Well, have you given people uh, clear expectations?" <laughs> versus, um, "Can you show me where they they're getting the information? Let's take a look at at uh, how they're making get, how they're getting this impression, you know, or something like that." I mean, it's really you can make it someone's fault or or not. So one that came up just earlier, and I, I, it actually came up in class, but I haven't, Nikki, I'm going to pick on you for a minute, because I think it was you that raised it in class. I saw someone um, post a mention also um, earlier referencing a different model that is called SAM. Um, and the fact that there's now two models actually in pretty different corners with that label, I think for um, people in this program, it's good to make the distinction between this SAM and Michael Allen's SAM. Right. Right. So I, ju I just want to acknowledge that, because I'd seen a, a, a question in class. And from my perspective, they're really just in two different corners. And it, it's a, sort of a matter of acronyms. You know, you're in different contexts. It's easy to come up with the same acronym for very different meanings. And acronyms. Are, <laughs> are, yes. are such a controversial thing to begin with, right? Uh, so, any so, other what, what questions are we missing, or, or or Linda, is there something else that you wanted us to discuss or think about? Well, I'm curious for those of the uh, those students who bent who are currently in 529 or who've had 529s. So in that class, we've been talking a little bit differently this week about levels. We've been talking about. Um, tactical, strategic, and um, I'm going to completely lose my language here, operational, thank you. But uh, it's a little different than the context that Tony's been talking about today, just language-wise. Are you seeing the connection? Do, they, do you see the, the linkage between those? Or is it worth sort of taking an, ex, uh, an explicit moment here to just talk about them? And attendees, if anybody wants to pop out and, and use your mic and you know, speak to the group, you could certainly be welcome to. Yep, Kevin's saying it's spot on. Ross is Jeff saying says it's useful. Yep. yep. Ross is saying different labels, but the levels make sense. Good. Yeah, Andrea, it's a nice plant, isn't it? <laughs> fits, it fits well with the, the Watkins book. And yes, Ray, I acknowledge the flips of those language. I've had several chats with people this week about the fact that the, the text you're reading has flipped language from uh, how many people are used to using them. But any other questions from your side or, or, or links yeah, that you think would be helpful from the questions you've been hearing? Go for it. Yeah, well, this, uh, this, yeah, this spot again. What I, what I was about to say is uh, over the, I, well, I've done a cursory uh, read of all the framework, the responses to the initial framework assignment, just to get an idea of what people are saying. And what I was about to actually do today or tomorrow is to get an announcement out. And one of the things I wanted to, to, to emphasize is that one way this can begin to sort of make sense, one way you can start to filter uh, all these models, you know, as applied to that framework, is to think about the projects that you have proposed or that you are tending to be, you know, excited about and working on, and think about, well, all right, is this a strategic project? Would this be strategic in nature? Would it be operational in nature? Would it be tactical in nature? And if I, even before I become a team or start working with other people on a team, um, which of the models do I think would apply and how would I apply it? In other words, you know, you've got all these models swimming in your head right now. 
but I would suggest the projects that we're headed into now might be a good way for you to translate uh, these models into something now that you could apply to a situation. So you might want to think about think of it uh, that way too. You know, I'd I'd also offer up that uh, using models is like using any other tool. The more often you do it, the more practice and you'll become at it, the more comfortable you'll feel with it. Um, now we do this explicitly in a couple courses, but um, you can certainly do it on your own. As you start to collect data and plug it into a model for whatever class you're taking, take that same data and plug it into a different model and see if it see if the other model that that you've chosen prompts you to ask additional questions that that are that you don't have answers from where you might want additional data or uh, pushes you to categorize or classify things in new and different ways that might be useful for you in in thinking about the problem or the solution that you've got in front of you none of these none of the models that we've had at least in my mind is a silver bullet they they're just tools that you use. There's not a right tool. There's not a wrong tool. There are just tools that can be used in certain situations to address the problems that are in front of you. And if uh, a lot of your job, I think, uh, comes in deciding which tools to use for which situation. And that really only comes from giving them a try. You know, it only takes a, a few minutes in many cases to sit down and start to plug uh, the data that you've got into some of the other models to see if it gives you a new perspective on things. And actually, Tony, I think one of the beauties of the, the synchronized analysis model is that it's a good illustration of doing that. You know, it's, it's an active example of pulling together from different models in order to make sense of them. And you know, the, Grayley put a, a little piece in the chat that relates to this. You know, in any given situation, you might want an element of some other tool to begin to blend together into the framework that works for you. Absolutely right. Yeah, the tools sh should serve you. You shouldn't be serving the tools. So don't feel constrained. The tools are there to help you perform uh, a given task, to solve a, a given problem. And so if the tool you're, you're working with doesn't help you to do that completely, shift or adapt what you have. And, and in line with that, Mickey, I, I can't speak to the original group. Maybe Tony can. But absolutely feel free to bring other ones in. You know, see what else occurs to you besides those five whys. And I'm curious if you have something in, in mind that, that's coming to mind for you. Yes, I don't necessarily recommend going through five whys over and over again with a client un unless they're prepared for it. Uh, that If they don't see the point or if they're not used to it, they can get impatient with the process. But there are other ways to do things. There are other ways to separate the, that data out. Yep, Ross is suggesting fishbone. That could be one, certainly. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> so also, Mickey, you can make them up. You know, the. Uh, so I'll just speak from my own experience, is that when I'm trying to figure things out, I do a lot of drawing things on paper, you know, sort of boxes and circles and arrows and trying to stack things up. Sometimes I do them on yellow stickies and move them around. You know, you may wind up with your own version. It doesn't have to be one that has an official label, provided that, you know, what you want to do is be able to communicate with it. So, you know, to come up in the end with the ways things fit together in order to make your case to other people. Yeah. I would. I, I... Um, and I'd love to hear what Bud thinks about this, but in my mind, there are not right and wrong. There's no right and wrong here. There is, you still at some point may have to defend your choices and the, your thinking around something, but the tools with which you think and how, how you apply them are up to you. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more with you, Tony. I mean, when it, it, I think in, when I look back at my initial client meetings that I've had, I think probably the most common first question I ask is, so tell me what's going on. And from there, 
uh, often the conversation will lead you in so many different directions, and the, the, the better versed you are in, you know, these models and the sort of the common language and approaches to these models, uh, the better you're able to fit your answers with where that client sort of wants to go, you know, and uh, it just, I don't know, it's not happens by magic, but it happens, you know, the, the more you know about these, the better off you are to have that conversation with your client. Yes. Yep. And, and, you know, when you go back offline and you're trying to figure it out for yourself, a number of these different authors have given us great lists of questions. At, at the moment, I can't remember whether the questions for each of the different levels from Rumbler and Brace are in the, the readings for 529 that we just did this last week, but there's at least one of their readings that has a list for each. You know, that where really you're trying to look at processes, you're trying to look at the organizational level. I mean, there's specific questions to ask. Allison Rossett, again, great groups of questions. So you don't have to remember these all at once. You know, you can talk with your client in the moment, observe, you know, go away and dig out some of these tools that people have given and see what else occurs to you um, to want to gather. You don't, have to, you don't have to have it all perfect the first time around. Yeah, that's also true. Thank you, Greeley. Tom Gilbert published a set of questions to match each cell on the BEM. I think it was in the Training and Development Journal around 1996, somewhere around there. I mean, we can find it and get it to everybody, but it's a series of questions mapped to each cell of the BEM. So, you know, I yeah, think he I, realized that there were, you know, that we needed those kind of tools, right? That, you know, we need to know what to ask. So. Yes. Yes, I've got those. Uh, I can I can dig those out and pass them around. They, they were called the probe questions, I think. And thanks everyone for for joining in and for your questions and participation today. Was, and thank you, Tony. Really terrific, terrific session.